This reading did raise a smile at the weekend. When you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat. <laughs> We've certainly had scorching heat, haven't we? And hopefully we'll have rain. <laughs> Some more of it anyway. We're used to interpreting the weather, aren't we? Particularly in a coastal community. We can predict the tides. We can see a bank of cloud rolling in. We can tell by the pickle in the atmosphere when it's going to be thundering. We are used to interpreting our surroundings. We can also sometimes track the ways that society is moving. We know we're about to hit a crisis as a nation when fuel prices rise and people begin to struggle. We can look ahead and predict how things are likely to go. There were those who were tasked with tracking the likely trajectory of the pandemic and what the patterns were going to be. And as human beings, we are used to taking the available information and interpreting it. And Jesus is encouraging his disciples in this reading to interpret what's going on around them, to pay attention to the collision that's going to happen between the message that Jesus is proclaiming and the state of society. Or to put it another way, a collision between the world as it is and the world as it should be. I came to bring fire to the earth, Jesus says, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptised and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. There is something in the nature of the way that we are together as church that we swing between extremes sometimes. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. Some Christian gatherings, it is almost peace at any price, and any dissenting voices are shushed. And we have a bit of a legacy of this that we're working through as the Church of England at the moment because so many survivors of abuse were silenced. And we're told, shh, we don't want to damage the mission of the church. We don't want to damage the way the church is seen in the community. We don't want there to be dissent and disagreement and argument amongst us. So, shh. And so people's lived experience and the ways in which people were mistreating others were swept under the carpet. Jesus is not one to sweep things under the carpet. From the Gospels you may have noticed this. Jesus is very much one about exposing the truth, telling the truth, shining a light into all the dark corners, and making sure that all voices are heard. The other end of things in the church is that we can be quite quick to condemn one another, to point fingers at one another, to decide who's in and who's out based on what people think, what their opinions are, what they agree with or disagree with, how they read the Bible, what their lifestyle is. And it is this strange mixture in human beings of on the one hand wanting to be one and unified and on the other hand tearing ourselves apart and creating divisions and partitions and barriers. And Jesus addresses this. He knows that his mission is controversial, that if he comes among us and speaks the real truth of God's word, it will be divisive because it will stir things up in people. When you tell someone an uncomfortable truth, they do not often thank you for it. In fact, sometimes it can break a relationship. And we're only grateful when someone tells us the truth, sometime afterwards, aren't we? Or even if we manage to be grateful at the time for the truth, it makes the other person really uncomfortable to be around. And so the people who do us the greatest service 
often get the worst side of us in the process. Because hearing the truth can be a really uncomfortable thing. And the inclination to push it away from ourselves and reject it often translates to pushing away and rejecting the person who brings us that uncomfortable truth. Jesus knows this. He knows that the society in which he is demonstrating love and speaking truth is being made uncomfortable by the things he's doing. He knows there's going to come a time when they will want to push him out, silence him, and destroy him. He knows that that time is coming, and as he preaches and teaches, he is aware that he is on borrowed time. But it does not slow him down, not even a little bit. It does not silence him. It does not soften the edges of his message in order to make his hearers comfortable. In our Old Testament reading, we have Jeremiah contrasting two sets of prophets. The prophets who give the real word of God, and the real word of God is described as being like wheat compared to straw. You can't eat straw. It's quite pretty, but you can't eat it. It has no nourishment value whatsoever, even if it is the same colour as wheat and seems to be of the same substance. From a distance you can't tell the difference, but you sure can when it's in your mouth. And then he compares the word of the Lord to fire and to like a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces. They're quite violent images. The word of God changes and transforms. It's not something you can hear and say, oh, that's nice, and then walk away, feeling, you know, slightly warm and fuzzy. The word of God, generally speaking, is not warm and fuzzy. It's not normally something we can walk away from unchanged. It's something we often either embrace or storm away from, because it's controversial. It's not easy. And God is saying here, I'm a God nearby, I'm near you, I'm speaking to you, I'm speaking these words of transformation, but you're listening to the prophets who are just telling you dreams, who are just telling you what you want to hear. They're prophesying lies, they're prophesying deceit. They're lulling God's people along a path that is taking them further away from God. And you can hear the heartbreak of God in these words. And especially in that reference to Baal. Now, Baal is a fertility god who was worshipped in all sorts of really quite unpleasant ways, including people sacrificing their children, literally taking babies and children and killing them as part of their worship and offering them up to Baal. And in all of God's time with God's people, God never took a child sacrifice. The closest it ever came was Abraham's faith being tested with Isaac. But God provided the ram for the offering because it wasn't really about the shedding of Isaac's blood. It was about Abraham being willing to surrender to God and about Isaac being willing to surrender to God. And while God will test the faith of people, and while God may call people to lay down their lives in his service, God does not call for pointless sacrifice in the way that the worship of the Baals did. The earth does not demand blood in order to be fruitful. Because God's already made the earth fruitful. We do not have to call God down as they used to call down Baal and the other gods to be present because God is already present everywhere. And it is a gift that Israel has taken for granted. And it is a gift that we sometimes take for granted. And it can be easy to look at others and find a source for division. Because there are always differences between us, differences in our approach. And there are some fights we have to have. There are other fights that are optional. And wisdom and discernment lies in knowing the difference. 
Elijah stood up against the prophets of Baal and defeated them in a showdown with two altars, two offerings, a whole lot of water and fire, and then eliminated the prophets of Baal. Why? Because they were a murdering sect that had nothing to do with real religion. And they were responsible for the slaughtering of children. That's the kind of fight you really have to have. And you really have to win. Because that kind of behaviour is worth being divided over. You have to win those kinds of fights because the alternatives are awful. But there are other fights we don't have to win because they're not really fights at all, they're differences. Differences in approach, differences in ways of being. And Jesus went and mingled amongst many groups of people. Jews, Greeks, Gentiles, Samaritans, those who were considered sinful and those who were considered holy. And Jesus moved freely between all those groups. And the only time that he really stood in condemnation was when one group was judging another. Think about that for a minute. Jesus stood in condemnation against one group when they were judging another. So when we consider the fights that God wants us to have, we need to consider them in really practical terms. What are we fighting against? Are we fighting against someone who makes us uncomfortable or someone who's a little bit different to us? Or are we fighting against the real harms and injustices and sufferings in this world? Because if we hurl ourselves into that kind of fight, God will be behind us, sword drawn, power ready. Because the Lord hates injustice. But if we're picking and snipping at each other, God is not going to back us up. God is going to be there shaking his head in grief and disappointment. Jesus talks about the baptism that he undergoes, and that baptism is a reference to the cross. Jesus didn't die for a system. He didn't die for a way of being right. He didn't die for a set of religious principles or even laws. Jesus died for people out of love. Because for God, it is about relationships and about love. And the stress that he is under as he carries every living person who has ever been and ever will be on his shoulders as he takes the sins of the whole world to the cross, as he suffers in that darkness and rises again. That bitter baptism is done out of love. And the reference to fire? Well, it could mean many things. Jesus talks about being lights in the world. And Jesus talks about the need to shine. The fire is also devouring and consuming. And when I read these words, I see the echoes of Pentecost in what Jesus is saying. Jesus has to die and return to heaven so that the Holy Spirit can come, so that that fire can fall, so that people hear the good news of God in their own languages. The Holy Spirit doesn't smooth all languages into one. The Holy Spirit interprets and translates so that each person hears the good news in their own language. There is unity and there is diversity. And that's all good in the Kingdom of God. So I encourage you to think about the moments we choose to accept division, because we have to in the name of justice, because there is a fight we really have to win, because the alternative is something awful, and we cannot allow evil to win. And then the fights that we pick that are less than holy, 
that are about our opinion, our preferences, our comfort, and sometimes about our ignorance because we don't take the time to understand others. We don't bother to translate. Think about the fights and struggles that you're currently engaged in, the sides that you find yourself on. We all have them. Sort them into those two categories. Really think about them. Pray for our church and for our nation as our leaders are divided about the best way forward. As a leadership contest is being fought in our national television. Listen and discern the voices. Listen for the voices of truth and prophecy. And pray to God for wisdom to know what battles to pick and which ones to avoid. Amen.